I'm Harry Benford, and I want to explain to you some of the arcane mysteries of tonnage measurement of ships. We are not talking here about weight tons, but rather legally defined measures of a ship's size and cargo hold capacity. Our units of measurement are neither long tons nor metric tons, but rather register tons of 100 cubic feet each. The subject is important to us because it has a, a major impacts on the operating economics of the ship, and in some instances, it will also affect the design of the ship. Taxes are usually based on uh, tonnage measurement, as are harbor fees, dry dock charges, the size of the crew and the licensing requirements are affected by the registered tonnage. Many regulations will apply to ships of a given size as measured by the tonnage measurement and will not apply to ships of other sizes. Finally, the ship owners are protected by something called limits of liability. What this amounts to is this. If the ship is engaged in some kind of a major accident, a catastrophe, perhaps lives are lost, the owner is protected against lawsuits in that there is an upper limit on the total amount that he may have to pay out to survivors of the people who are killed, for example. And this limit of liability is based on so many dollars per gross ton of the vessel plus the value of the vessel after the accident. And if after the accident the ship happens to be uh, resting on the bed of the ocean, then that value of the ship is zero. For all of these reasons, the owners want to make the registered tons as small as possible for any given dead weight on their ship. The normal ship, ocean-going ship, will have as many as three different sets of tonnage measurements because if it is going to go through the Panama Canal, it will have a, uh, a special set of rules for that canal. The same for the Suez Canal. And then each nation has its own set of rules for the measurement of these registered tons. Currently, today, those rules are the same for all nations, although in the past there was quite a bit of difference in them. The peculiarities that we find in the current national rules, and those are the ones that we want to talk about today, those peculiarities are there because they are rooted in history. And we find these roots in history are a necessary evil because ship owners do not want any change in the law that will produce a sudden increase in the registered tonnage of their existing ships. You can understand that. And almost as bad, or perhaps even worse, they don't want any change in the law that will reduce the registered tonnage for their competitors. So that whenever a change in the law comes about, we must pay attention to what the tonnage measurements used to be and try to make the uh, new law uh, coincide as far as the outcome is concerned with what would be produced under the old law. Now the roots of our history in this are traceable back to 15th century England. <clears throat> Actually we think that back in, in uh, prehistoric times that there were uh, lighthouse fees charged against the ships of the ancients. But our current laws go back at least as far as A.D. 1423 in England. In those days, believe it or not, the major import into England was wine coming over from the continent, from Germany, from France, and Italy. And in order to raise taxes to support his court and his military services, the King of England taxed that wine. He placed a tariff on it. And in order to discourage smuggling, he decreed that the wine had to be brought in in oversized barrels of 252 gallons each. That is six times the size of your normal barrel of 42 gallons. These barrels were the largest size container that could readily be taken over the road by horse and wagon. And each of these barrels of wine, 252 gallons, happened to weigh, on the average, 2,240 pounds, which you may recognize as being the long ton. And this is where our long ton uh, originated. In order to 
tax ships, the decision was made to base that tax on the cargo hold capacity of the ship as measured in the numbers of these tons that it would carry. So the tax collector merely had to send a clerk down to the ship side and have him count the uh, tons, T-U-N-S, uh, that were taken out of the ship because these large oversized barrels were called tons, T-U-N-S. Let's look at this chart and I will show you uh, a little bit of the development uh, of this measurement of ton capacity for ships. So these were the early tonnage rules. This was the first one. They simply counted the number of tons of capacity of the ship. And in those days, this was both the volumetric capacity as measured in terms of these oversized barrels, and it was also the weight capacity in long tons. Now, what if the ship carried something other than wine and something that was coming in uh, not in tons, but in uh, other form. Well, they tried multiplying the dimensions of the ship together and dividing by a number that would give about the same figure as they would have come up with had they counted the number of these barrels. By 1720, this had evolved to this form, and it remained in this form for over 100 years, that the tonnage was approximately equal to the cargo deadweight, DW sub C. The exact measurement of tonnage was taken as the length of the ship times the beam. And they had originally had in here the draft of the ship, but since draft was sometimes hard to measure, they substituted half the beam because that was the approximate proportion of most ships in those days. So that going across then and multiplying out, we had the length times the beam squared over two and divided by 94. Where did the 94 come from? That was based on a series of assumptions which were reasonable for that day. It assumed a block coefficient of 62%, and it assumed that the cargo deadweight would be 60% of the ship's displacement. Now, if you will remember that salt water uh, weighs, uh, or occupies 35 cubic feet per long ton, and you multiply those numbers out, you will come up with a figure very close to 94, and this presumably uh, explains where that number comes from. <clears throat> now, what we have here was all right for existing ships, <clears throat> but what about a ship in the design stage? Obviously, the owner, his naval architect, would look at this and say, aha, they're going to tax me on length, they're going to tax me on the beam squared, they're not going to tax me at all on the depth or the draft. So it was obviously a great temptation for them to make their ships much too narrow and much too deep. The result being, of course, that the ships lacked proper stability. Other misguided notions and variations followed. And 150 years ago, there was a widespread recognition that there was some need for reform. And a British naval architect named George Moorsom in 1854 proposed the system uh, that has a direct impact on what we have today. Let me call uh, to your attention this next chart. <clears throat> 1854, George Moorsom. He proposed, and his proposals were shortly adopted in England and then throughout the rest of the maritime world, two measures. And in both of them, a registered ton was going to be taken equal to 100 cubic feet. Now, where did that 100 cubic feet come from? He surveyed the entire merchant marine of the, of, of the, uh, under the British flag and determined that if he used a figure here of 98 and a fraction, that he would make the cumulative registered tonnage under the new law come out the same as it had been under the old law. And so he wisely rounded it up to 100. Now that pleased the ship owners because that, on the average, reduced their registered tonnage a little bit. The harbor authorities perhaps didn't like it because that meant they were going to collect less uh, in the line of taxes, but they were always free to raise the rates. So here we have the tonnage measurement now in terms of 100 cubic feet, divorcing ourselves entirely from weight as a basis for the measurement of tonnage at this point. <clears throat>
Now, I said he proposed two measures. These were, first of all, the gross tons, GT, gross tons, which was a rough measure of the ship's overall size. And then, secondly, the net tons, which was a rough approximation to the whole size of the ship, and this was supposed to be proportional then to the ship's money earning capacity. And some assessments would be based on gross tons, for example, dry dock fees. Taxes were more likely to be based on earning capacity, hence hold size. Now, they, this was blind to whether or not you were carrying a very valuable cargo, whether it was dry or liquid or whatever, or how fast the ship was going. So it was a pretty crude measure of money earning capacity, but it was good enough, they felt, for the purpose. Now, both of these were uh, only approximate measures for reasons that uh, I will uh, point out here shortly. <clears throat> Let's next look at some of the details, first of the gross tonnage under the Moorsome system. <clears throat> The gross tonnage <clears throat> was taken as the entire internal volume in cubic feet minus some exemptions. These were spaces that were not measured at all. So you didn't really subtract them, you simply didn't measure them. But then it was divided by 100 to get the units correct. So the gross tonnage then was the entire internal volume less certain exemptions. The net tonnage was taken as the gross tonnage minus certain deductions, and these were for non-money earning spaces, and again dividing by 100. <clears throat> the volumes were found using Simpson's rule, which at that time was still a new device for naval architects. <clears throat> <clears throat> and I want to show you how these measurements were made uh, that went into Simpson's rule. Let's look at this next chart. <clears throat> The horizontal measurements were taken not to the molded line inside the shell, but to the interface of the shell frames. If the frames were fitted with uh, wooden battens, then the measurement was taken to the interface of the battens. Or if this were perhaps an insulated hole and there were insulation in here, then that horizontal measurement would be taken to the interface of the insulation. So that the horizontal measurements were in effect net available space, more or less the same as bale capacity. The vertical measurements, on the other hand, were taken from the tank top right up to the underside of the deck above. So that was more like a measurement of grain capacity. So it was a mixed bag of measurements. And the same was true in superstructure or deck houses. The horizontal measurements taken from inside a frame to inside a frame. Vertical measurements taken from top of this deck the underside of the deck above. All right, <clears throat> let's talk next about the exemptions. <clears throat> These are shown on this next chart. The exemptions were, first of all, the double bottoms. Nobody wanted to crawl around in double bottoms and make the measurements, so they wisely exempt those from tonnage measurement. The peak tanks were often exempt. I put a question mark here because in some nations they were exempt, in other ones they were not exempt. In the United States, for example, they would be exempt if they were fitted only for ballast water or left empty. If, however, you uh, were going to put cargo oil in them or fuel oil, then uh, you would not win them as an exemption. Now, for reasons that we will not go into, non-tight portions of the superstructure were left exempt from tonnage measurement. And that was a loophole in the law that I'm going to come back to before we get through here. There were other exemptions, too. Some of these were rather peculiar. For example, the galley in the ship, if it had a bake oven in it, would be exempt. Otherwise, it would not be exempt, but would later be taken out as a deduction. Well, speaking of deductions, let's look at those on this next chart. <clears throat> the deductions were such things as the crew quarters. These, un you understand, are non-money earning spaces. Crew quarters, working spaces, the steering engine room, for example, or the, or the navigation bridge. Uh, places for stores, bosun stores, machinery stores, and that sort of a thing. And the machinery space itself uh, was a deduction. <clears throat> Now, the Moorsome system was a great improvement over the 
uh, previous systems, a lot more logical in many respects. But it had loopholes, which in time led to poor design. And let me show you two of these major uh, examples of poor design uh, that came about as a result of the Morrison system. The first one is concerned with the machinery space deduction. I've made a plot here. And the horizontal scale is non-dimensional. It is the ratio of the volume of the machinery space to the gross tonnage, both, of course, in terms of 100 cubic feet. The vertical scale is the ratio of the deduction to the gross tonnage. Again, non-dimensional. These are both in the same units of 100 cubic feet each. If this ratio of the volume of the machinery space to the gross tonnage happened to be less than 13%, or more than 22%, then you were allowed to increase the volume of the machinery space for purposes of this deduction by 75%. That is, you'd be on a slope here of 1.75 times the volume of the machinery space. And that would be interrupted if you uh, between 13 and 20% and then would continue on with the same slope. If you came between these figures of 13 and 20%, then you would jump up at this point to a 32% deduction. If you were just below 13%, 1 and 3 quarters times 13% comes out 22 and 3 quarters percent, you'd be about there. When the rule w was written in Morsum's time, back 150 years ago, I suppose that the typical engine room was uh, perhaps something like 11 or 12% of the uh, gross tonnage. And apparently, nobody knows this for sure, apparently the authorities thought that it would be a humane thing to encourage the designers and the shipbuilders to make the engine rooms a little bit bigger to improve the ventilation and the clearances there for those poor devils that had to work in those very hot engine rooms. So the, uh, the law was written this way, and the owner would then uh, in increase the size of his machinery space so as to get this larger deduction. And that was all right at first. But as technology developed and boilers became smaller and steam turbines replaced uh, steam reciprocating engines, then the logical place for uh, the engine room size to be was down here much lower, perhaps 8 to 10% of the gross tonnage. But still, they wanted this larger deduction. So they made the engine rooms vastly larger than necessary. And if you went into one of those engine rooms, you would think that you were entering an empty airplane hangar. There was so much waste space in them. <clears throat> now, another example of the poor design that arose because of the loopholes in the Moorsom system was something called a shelter deck ship. Now, shelter deck ships no longer exist today, uh, but you will run across this in the literature and I want to uh, give you some details on uh, what this amounted to. <clears throat> Let's look at this next chart. <clears throat> Shelter deck ships had something in them that came to be called tonnage openings. In the shelter deck ship, the freeboard deck was taken as the second deck, although there was a deck above it that in effect and structurally amounted to a complete superstructure deck. This was the strength deck. But because of loopholes in the law, it was treated as though it were a discontinuous deck, uh, just as though uh, there was no shell plating or deck in this area at all, so that you had a long bridge and a short poop, in effect. And this allowed them to make this the freeboard deck. And this was all right for ships that were carrying uh, cargo that was uh, bulky in size but didn't weigh much, as is true of many manufactured goods. Now, in order to uh, beat the rules, to take advantage of the loopholes, they had to cut into the deck a small hatch, generally placed near the stern of the ship. And this had to be at least four feet fore and aft. In width, it had to equal the width of the aftermost um, cargo hatch on the deck running from port to starboard. You could not put a tall combing on this. It had to be a low combing. You could put a one-piece steel hatch cover on it if you wanted to, but you could not put any gaskets 
in here or paint it shut. And you could not put closely spaced bolts through here. They had to be widely spaced bolts. So that this was theoretically a non-tight cover, non-weather tight, although there wouldn't be very much water get in there, obviously. It was in a sheltered location, and that uh, steel hatch cover on there would keep most of the water out. This opened into a space that was, again, four feet or a little bit more from four and aft uh, between bulkheads, <clears throat> and this was called a tonnage well. Tonnage hatch, tonnage well. And in any watertight, otherwise watertight bulkheads forward of this, they would cut tonnage openings in the bulkhead. Now these had to be at least four feet high and three feet wide, and you could put a cover over them if you wanted to, but again, no gaskets and no closely spaced bolts. So that this space was in theory open to the sea, and because of this tonnage opening in the bulkhead, that left this space open to the sea. And from a legal point of view, this was a, a non-tight portion of the superstructure and hence would be exempt from tonnage measurement. <clears throat> this was carried to the extreme in the uh, shelter deck ship, as I'm going to show you in the next sketch. <clears throat> Let's look at this one, please. Here is a shelter deck ship. Now, I have shown it with two decks. You could have other decks below here. But the uppermost deck was the strength deck, and it was called the shelter deck. The second deck was the freeboard deck. Freeboard was measured down from the top of this deck. This tonnage hatch was put back here near the stern, opening into a tonnage well. Then there was tonnage openings uh, in each of these transverse bulkheads so that this space was open to the sea. In theory, this was open to the sea, this was open to the sea, this was open to the sea, and this was open to the sea. Now, only a well-trained lawyer could look you in the eye and say, aha, all of this is open to the sea and therefore um, should be exempt from tonnage measurement. But this is the way the, the law was written and this is what came about, the shelter deck ship. They did not put tonnage openings in these end bulkheads because after all, uh, this was going to be a storage space up here. Uh, this would be a working space with a steering engine. So they would later be deducted and uh, would not show up in the net tonnage. <clears throat> now, obviously, this was poor design from a naval architecture point of view because if the ship were in an accident and this, any of these holes were uh, <clears throat> punctured in a collision, then progressive flooding uh, could occur through these openings and through these uh, hatches. These hatches, incidentally, were supposed to be fitted with uh, canvas covers, tarpaulins, so that they could be made uh, weather tight. But in practice, I'm sure that very, very few ship owners actually did cover them. <clears throat> so this was a, a clear example of how the law was leading to poor engineering, making the ships less safe than they really should have been. <clears throat> now, these two examples that I've given you uh, were not the only ones, but they were perhaps the, the major causes for discontent uh, throughout the industry uh, in the uh, workings of the Moorsome system. And all of this led in 1969 to an international conference that was held in London under the auspices of IMCO. IMCO is an acronym for International Maritime Consultative Organization. It has since changed its name to IMO. They've dropped the consultative. It's now International Maritime Organization. It is a branch of the United Nations. So they, they held this conference in 1969, trying to find out some ways in which they could modernize the law to rid it of these you know, peculiarities that were leading to poor design, but at the same time to leave the gross tonnage and net tonnage pretty much the same as they'd been before. This was no easy thing to do. But they came up with an amazingly simple concept, and it has since been approved by a majority of the maritime nations and therefore came into force in 1982 throughout the world and practically all of the major maritime nations uh, now use this. <clears throat> Let me show you the details of the new law. 
first as it applies to gross tonnage. <clears throat> the gross tonnage of the ship is equal to a constant K1 times V, in which V is the entire internal volume. Now in cubic meters, the measurements are no longer in feet, but in meters. And this constant K1 is equal to 0.2 plus 0.02 times log to the base 10 of V, the entire internal volume in cubic meters. Now this K1 value serves three functions. First of all, the measurement is now to the shell, to the molded lines, and this work can be done uh, in the design stage rather than on the ship itself. So you take internal measurements, molded dimensions. We have gotten away from the concept of exemptions so that we are including the double bottom and so forth in this calculation. And the third function served by K1 uh, is to recognize that although the measurements are made in meters, giving us a volume in cubic meters, that the equivalent is really in terms of registered tons of 100 cubic feet as before. It never makes any mention of feet whatsoever in the calculation, and yet the uh, value of K is taken to give us this 100 cubic foot equivalent. So in short, the new registered tons is going to come out very close to the old registered tons. And that is true whether we are talking about gross tons or net tons. <clears throat> now I want to uh, talk next about the details for net tonnage. <clears throat> and let's look at this uh, next chart with me, please. If you have no passengers on the ship, then the measurement is just a little bit more complicated than what we had for gross tonnage. It's now a constant K2 times V sub C, which is the cargo hold volume in cubic meters. And again, that is the molded volume. Multiplied by a correction factor, which is intended to give approximately the same answers for shelter deck ships or non-shelter deck ships um, as they were before the change was made in the law. And that correction factor amounts to four times the draft over three times the depth of the hold, that expression squared. And K2 now looks exactly the same as it did for gross tonnage, except that it's multiplied now by the log to the base 10 of V sub C, the cargo hold volume, instead of the total volume. <clears throat> now, however, there are two provisos that go with this rule for net tonnage. <clears throat> The first one is that this ratio of 4D to 3D, let's look at this next chart, please. <clears throat> this ratio of 4 times the draft over 3 times the depth squared uh, must not exceed unity. And secondly, the net tonnage must not be taken as less than 30% of the gross tonnage. And those two provisos were put in there to prevent excessive rule beating of any sort. <clears throat> there are other complications if the ship carries passengers, but we, we can uh, skip that and not go into it here. <clears throat> I want to illustrate the new law by going through a simple numerical example with you. And the inputs for this are spelled out in the next chart. <clears throat> Here's our example. It's a cargo ship with no passengers. We're going to assume that the entire internal volume is 45,000 cubic meters. The volume of the cargo hold is 33,000 cubic meters. Nice round numbers. We're going to assume that the depth of the ship is 20 meters and the draft is 14 meters. <clears throat> Let's apply the equation first for gross tonnage and that's shown on the uh, next chart that we have here. <clears throat> Let's look at that. Gross tonnage, you'll remember, is equal to K1 times V, in which V is the entire internal volume. And K1 is 0.2 plus 0.02 times log to the base 10 of V, the volume. You'll, we'll, we'll, you will remember that we assume this to be 45,000, so we substitute the 45,000 cubic meters in here. And with our little pocket calculator, we can find the log to the base 10 of 45,000 is 4.653 
and we multiply that by 0.02 and add 0.2, and we come up with a K1 value of 0.2931. Therefore, the gross tonnage is 0.2931 times the internal volume of 45,000 cubic meters, or 13,188 registered tons. I'll leave this up here for just a moment in case you want to copy those numbers. <coughs> And then we will uh, move on to looking at the uh, calculation for net tonnage. <clears throat> All right, I'll give you just a couple more seconds, and then we'll want to shift over. <clears throat> All set? All right. Now we want to talk about the calculation for uh, net tonnage, and that's on this next little chart. <clears throat> The net tonnage equation, you will, will remember, I hope, was K2 times the volume of the cargo hold multiplied by this correction factor, 4 times the draft or 3 times the depth squared. And K2 is 0 0.2 plus 0 0.02 times log to the base 10 of the volume of the cargo hold, which was 33,000 cubic meters under our assumptions. The log to the base 10 of 33,000 is 4.519. Again, you can find that quite readily with most of your pocket calculators. And that comes up then 0.2904. <clears throat> That's the K2 value. Uh, this value here, 4 times the draft over 3 times the depth squared, is 4 times 14 over 3 times 20 squared. And that comes out 0.8711, which we're going to substitute uh, there. And we can also examine this and say, aha, that's less than one, therefore we have met one of these provisos. <clears throat> now I want to uh, then next calculate the tentative net tonnage, and I say it's tentative because we're not going to accept it until we make sure that both of the provisos are met. Let's look at the next chart, please. The tentative net tonnage then is equal to K2 times the um, volume of the cargo hold times this four draft over three depth squared, which has a value of 0.8711. Uh, this K2 we calculated just a moment ago is 0.2904, and we multiply that through, and we come up with a net tonnage of 8348 registered tons. Now, we've got to make sure that that is at least 30% of the gross tonnage, so we take its ratio, net tonnage to gross tonnage, 8348 over 13188, and that comes out 0.63, which is greater than the minimum requirement of 30%. Uh, so we are okay on that. We've already met this other proviso of this ratio uh, being less than one. So our net tonnage, therefore, comes out to this value of 8348. And again, I'll leave that there for a few seconds in case you want to copy those numbers. <coughs> All right, just a couple more seconds, please. In summary, then, this new law is a variation, uh, in effect, on the Moorsom system. There are differences in it, however. Uh, the, there are differences in how the measurements are taken. They are now molded dimensions rather than net internal dimensions. There are differences in what spaces are measured. Double bottoms, for example, are now measured. The units of measurement, of course, are now cubic uh, meters instead of uh, cubic feet, although the answer comes out the equivalent of 100 cubic feet. It eliminates the benefits of the tonnage opening, so the whole concept of the shelter deck ship is dead, and it returns the freeboard deck to the uppermost continuous deck rather than the second deck. So these are obvious improvements uh, to make the ships safer and give you no strong incentive to try to beat the rule and cut a bunch of ridiculous openings uh, in your ship. <clears throat> the Suez and Panama Canal tonnages remain unchanged, and they have gross tonnage and net tonnage figures too, so that uh, most ocean-going ships today have three sets of tonnage measurements, and in each case a gross tonnage and a net tonnage. And the uh, units are essentially the equivalent of 100 cubic feet each, although the measurements are made in uh, metric units. I have omitted many, many uh, details, particularly in the, in the history of all of this.
uh, that's really non-essential to us now. I've given you a good enough foundation on which to uh, build a thorough knowledge of the uh, tonnage measurement for ships. For more information, let me call to your attention two important references where they're shown on this next chart. <clears throat> for more information, I refer you to Chapter 5 in the Society of Naval Architects book, Ship Design and Construction, published in 1980. Or if you want the complete details and right out of the horse's mouth, you can write Ed Measurements Branch, U.S. Coast Guard, Department of Transportation, Washington, D.C. You'd better spell it out and don't abbreviate it uh, as I have done here. Uh, in closing, let me say that the, the new law that we have now had since 1983 is a great improvement over what we've ever had before. It's possibly not perfect, and no doubt the sea lawyers among us will eventually find some loopholes to come up with some perhaps ridiculous designs in the future. I don't see how they're going to do it, but they may. Remember this, that whenever you mix law and engineering, eventually engineering tends to suffer. Law may too, for all I know. And with that sobering thought, I will close this discussion of measurements for tonnage for merchant ships. Thank you.